Father, we thank you for today. We thank you again for all the abundant blessings that you have given us. The, abl- the blessing of hearing voices blend for you. We thank you for the light that is within us that we so humbly want and so desperately need to have shine within us. So give us the strength and the courage to recognize when to get out of the way, when to remove our shadow so that that light shines for someone in need. We just simply give all that we are unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Continuing on with what Haley read earlier, Mark 4 Verses 14 through 20 is what I will read. The farmer sows the word, and this is the explanation of what the parable that Haley read earlier. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution come because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries and cares of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. Well, another year's upon us, as we've already discussed, and with it comes hopes of fresh starts, new beginnings, another set of goals and expectations that at least, <laughs> at least we hope will outlast the winter months. 2014 was a year for me where I set out what I thought was a rather lofty goal at the time, but it was one that I was set out to attain nonetheless. And that was in taking my love for health and fitness into the relatively competitive field of personal training. I purchased an online course. I had a nine-month timetable in which to get certified. Easy, right? Well, I received my material in the mail, and like a kid at a candy shop, I was super excited at what lie ahead. I want to fast forward three months, so we're looking at March. There were these books, white pages, I tell you people, white pages. These books were so thick, so overwhelming to look at, and yeah, they were still in their box, Still had dust on top, still unread, still a goal yet to be achieved. And I said to myself, Chuck, let's go. You got to get this done. Fast forward another four months. Yep, still in their box. Still the same old story. I was determined though, but time was running out. So I finally cracked open the material and I found the answer I was looking for. How to file for an extension. I was excited. Once granted a three-month extension, I had to get serious this time, so I buckled down. I took and passed the 33 required quizzes that even ha- they have to be passed before you can even have access to the final exam. And this final exam included 100 multiple-choice questions as well as putting together a 12-week comprehensive workout and nutrition plan for two people chosen at random. Exhausting, right? That was a lot of stuff. I'm proud to say Christmas last year, I became a certified personal trainer through the International Sports Sciences Association. There's nothing like waiting until the last minute, right? Well, unto this goal, my goal for this past year in 2015 was to find my niche and establish myself in the industry. To think that I was going to fall into this mega training, too many clients to keep track of, full-time trainer, was not only an unrealistic goal, but it was one that didn't even make practical or logical sense. But I simply believed in God's absolute best for me. I've always known that I was purposed to help others, to share my story, and to learn about their story in the process. It was a slow road to success, but I soon found myself with a steady stream of clients. Now, as you can imagine, with each client came a different set of goals, a different set of training routines, a different approach. Some were new to exercise altogether. Some were seasoned veterans of various exercise programs that are out there, ranging from boot camps to uh, the latest thing, if you will, called cross-training, which in its simplest form is infusing a cardio aspect of a workout, like running on a treadmill or jumping jacks, and then also doing strength training. So it's it's a cross between the two. But relative to today's scripture text, I was awakened to Jesus' message to his disciples, and to us as well, 
that shared a different type of cross training, if you will. As children of the Most High God, we're commanded to go and lead others to Christ. You could say that Jesus is a personal trainer to all of us, amen? He lifts us up when we're down. He motivates us when we don't feel like it. He picks us up. He pushes us. He challenges us. Most importantly, he lovingly guides us in the direction that he has for our lives. In this discourse, Jesus is speaking to such a large crowd, such a large crowd that he was cast, or he cast himself into a boat. And he spoke to this large crowd, sharing the story of the sower and the four soils. Now we know the word of God to be alive and active, and that said, these stories are relative to us today as they were to the throngs of people in attendance that day. In this parable, Jesus sets the stage and the list of characters that surround this amazing tale of both sowing and reaping. Have you ever heard the expression, the drama is in the details? Well, in this story, Jesus uses, again, an example of a sower and four different types of soil. We can look at the seed as the word of God, his presence in our lives, if you will. So in God's seed being cast, the reader can relate and be inspired by the fact that they need to have and make sure that theirs, their seed is rooted deep in good soil. And that drama, ladies and gentlemen, is in the details of everybody's story. Your story, my story, they're all unique, they're all different, but we serve the same God. And that's where the drama is in. So... We have, we have a visual, if you will. When you read this story, we have a visual of casting seed. So back in this time, there wasn't Cub Cadet. There wasn't John Deere. There wasn't all those farm and fleet places where a mass broadcasting of seed took place. A farmer did it by hand, and he did so liberally to create a maximum effect. So the first example, as Haley read, was, sown, was seed sown on a footpath. After a while, the birds came, took away that seed. The next seed is that which was cast on shallow ground. There was initial growth, but lacking nutrient-rich soil, the heat of the sun came, and as a result, the seed withered away. The third seed was cast and fell among thorns, and when the seed took root, the presence of those thorns essentially choked out the seed, and it too died. The last is that seed cast on good soil, and it produced up to 30 and 60 and even 100 times or a hundredfold. All right, again, in reading this story, we can attribute the parable to the sower being one who was casting seed of the gospel and our initial conversion is relative to these examples. I see this as a call to arms to make sure that our seed and that the seed that was planted in us is rooted in deep, nutrient-rich soil. But when asking the Lord what he wanted me to share with you all this morning, he revealed to me that this parable's lesson is perpetual, And it's a perpetual one that, in essence, grows with us on our journey with the Lord. Like many life lessons gleaned from the pages of the good book, God revealed to me that this was a lesson continuing, this was a lesson, excuse me, in continuing to ask and keep on asking, to continue to seek and keep on seeking, to continue to knock and keep on knocking. We've all heard of the saying, when opportunity knocks, well, this cross training, if you will, is first of all about winning souls over to Christ. But with us on the cusp of yet another new year, it is about seizing the moment, continually casting that seed of opportunity to witness for Christ, of course, but also to bring to fruition the plans that God has for us as his children in the process. Those plans are to prosper. Those plans are not to bring us harm, as recorded in Isaiah 29, 11. Now, just as in the parable of the sower, the key is in casting an abundant amount of seed, to be aware of every aspect and all areas of our life where God is leading and guiding us. Let's look at that first seed that was cast. It fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Metaphorically speaking, these birds are those attitudes and mindsets that can carry away our dreams and our aspirations. How do birds get seed? They pick and they peck at what lies on the surface, not what is embedded in the ground. How many times have we set out to do something with great aspiration only to put it off to the next day, the next week, or the next month. I know I do it, and I've probably done it more recently than I care to um, think about. And again, these opportunities could be an opportunity to witness, an opportunity to volunteer here at church or somewhere else, an opportunity to simply be there for a friend, or how about praying for another? 
But due to the seed of these opportunities being cast, but not deeply rooted in our passion and with our passion and desire, these nagging birds of doubt, birds of reluctance, and birds of uncertainty come and essentially carry that seed away. The drama in the details must include the truth that oftentimes we find ourselves chasing after these birds. And when we do that, we leave the sower's field. We leave the area, the place, the person that God is leading us to talk to. We go chasing birds, ladies and gentlemen. We go following these birds. So instead of chasing our passions and desires and making our passions and desires those of the Lord's, we're chasing blackbirds. We're chasing robins. We're chasing finches. Oh, look at that finch over there. And we run and we leave the mission field, if you will. You guys understand where I'm going with that. The next example is a seed that was cast on shallow ground. Last year, and those of you that know me, I think I've shared it before, um, I, I am not a handyman by any stretch of the imagination. I don't claim to be, but there were some outdoor, outdoor landscaping projects that needed to be done at the house. And again, I said, here we go. I had aspirations of making this work. I mean, if the guys on Home and Garden Television can do it, why can't I do it? Why can't I have a beautiful yard in three easy episodes? Well, didn't work that way, of course. I had somebody come out, somebody that did what they were doing. They came out, they looked at my yard, I told them what I wanted to do. They gave me an accurate, well, an estimated measurement of how much dirt and mulch that I would need. Said, sounds good, acting like I knew what I was talking about. Again, I don't know math. So when he's saying, you need this many yards, I said, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Sounds good to me. So, I come home. Well, I get a text from my mother, and she says, your dirt has arrived. And... You know, I don't care, I don't care uh, texting or not. When you know the person, you know the tone with which they're sending the text. She knew that I had no clue what I was getting into, and she just, I, I, oh my God, sarcasm was, I mean, she might as well have typed sent with sarcasm because it was just right there. She's like, your dirt has arrived. She wasn't touching it, you know. She was more concerned the fact her car couldn't get in the garage. Well, anyways, I come home to this monstrosity of a pile of dirt. If that wasn't enough, my neighbor comes over. Do you realize how much dirt that is? And I said, I do now. So I'm busier, as my grandma would say. I love her to death. My grandma would say, I was busier than a rat in a marble floor at the time. I was personal training. I was working. I was leading worship here, doing a lot of things. And now I got to shovel mulch, put it in the back, all that stuff. Suddenly, I don't like home and garden television. Well, I will say this. I take pride in the, in the accomplishment that I got, and I did it myself. I got every wheelbarrow of that dirt, every yard of that mulch, every yard of that spread out, and I created some, some neat landscape uh, and etched some patterns out that were pretty cool. So when the time came to cast my seed, I, like the sower in this story, had to do so liberally, but with the dry weather that was upon us last summer and my reluctance to... <laughs> Minor detail, my reluctance to water on a consistent basis. I didn't see the results that I'd hoped for at the onset of this project. In addition, as I witnessed grass sprouting in most of the areas, there were a few where I had bare spots. Once the hot summer months were over, I was able to assess the situation, and I realized when I went and spoke with the landscaper that gave me the estimate, and I told him what I did and everything that I did, minus the watering, of course, and he told me, you can't control the elements. You can't control what the weather's going to be. We don't know what the weather's going to be on a daily basis, let alone in a particular month. He says, right now, it's the hottest time of year. I don't recommend that you plant any more seed because you can't control when that weather is going to change. He said, ride out these summer months, recast your seed. So that's what I did. And I had to ensure that it was in dense soil. Here's the key, ladies and gentlemen. The same holds true in our walk with the Lord and our walk with with others along the way. There are going to be times of spiritual drought. This was an example relative to me that, that spoke to me as I read this scripture, but it is also an example of the need for being attention to detail oriented. When we set out to do the Lord's work, again, to share, to listen, or to simply be there for another, we can see the fruits of our labor and feel pretty good about how we're growing as a believer. But these unforeseen elements likened to those in the example, are out of our control. 
Like the weather, we cannot control how others may react to our humble offering of giving of our time or saying that we will pray for them or wanting to help them through a difficult situation. Just as I learned after the fact that casting seed takes a constant tending to, so to we, when we cast our seed, have to be attentive to those that God brings our way. And trust me, he will give us what we need to say and what to share. We just have to simply get out of the way. The third example talks about those thorns that grow alongside the seed. They overtake the crop. I like the phrase, weed your garden. My mom used to say that up to me. I didn't quite understand it, you know, but it meant, you know, the troublemakers you're hanging out with, weed your garden. Stop hanging out with those kids. They're no good. I didn't understand what that meant. I said, I don't, I don't tend a garden. I don't know what you mean. But this example of casting seed only to have thorns of negativity and doubt surround it, and as the growth of a positive, that seed occurs, so too does the growth of a negative. Like the casting of seed in earlier examples, this is a seed that was cast with good intention. It had measurable results, but those naysayers of thorns of negativity, if you will, creep in and they overtake the good. Likened to the adage, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. If a seed is not cast in deeply rooted soil, if we are not so convicted in our passion to be light and salt for his glory, to put on the full armor of God as recorded in Galatians, we, like that seed, will be susceptible to those attacks of the naysayers, and our witness, in essence, will be choked out as a result. Ah, the last example, the good seed. We've all read this story. We know how it ends. The good soil is the example our Father wants us to emulate. I mean, who wouldn't want to yield a crop 30, 60, or 100 fold? Now, relative to the previous examples I've listed, every chance, every opportunity we have to witness for Him as well as, we set, as, well as set out to achieve what He has purposed for us in our lives is given according to the ability that He has given us. If our position at work, if our place or position in our community, etc., is a 30 fold crop, then make it the best 30-fold crop that you can be. And the same holds true for the 60 and the 100. The key here is to trust in God's plans for us, those prosperous plans that come with a blessed end and are not meant to harm us. This message today, this parable, has awakened my spirit to the truth that every day, every moment, is a chance to cast a seed. It is a chance for us to make a difference in the life of another, Again, the drama is in the details of our lives and in our relationship with the Father. First, we must recognize that the seed of our conversion has to be nurtured to emulate the goodness of God. Don't worry. I've neglected to do that myself. I've said and done things not reflective of a child of the King. I have, in essence, dimmed the light of Christ within me. But our God is loving and forgiving. Amen? He wants us to cast our seed and keep on casting, to seize every moment to advance his kingdom. How do we do this? By first tending to the soil of our own garden, and also in casting our seed and our witness to others, we ensure that it is a seed that is buried deep in the soil, that it is nurtured, and that it is able to withstand the elements. As a trainer's job is to bring out the best in their client, Christ seeks to bring out the best in us. But as I've learned as a trainer to many this past year, I am only as effective as my clients allow me to be. Christ wants our very best, and his, as his children, we too have to allow him to reap that harvest in our lives. All of God's children said, Amen. Amen.